their electoral responsibilities is, is another question. Yes, sir. With an OSINT uh, information repository, do you ever believe there's a uh, need for anonymous information submission, or should only the right people be able to figure out who the actual submitter is? I think everybody, well, there is a value to anonymous sources that are consistently proven right. Um, I don't have any hard rules. Uh, on balance, I think being open about who you are and what you've collected is right, because if you're, if you're, if you're stealing the information and posting it, that's not really OSINT. Uh, that's theft. Um, and so I'm not looking to inspire, I mean, I encourage whistleblowing. Uh, I encourage anonymous whistleblowing. I encourage the reporting of any violation by any corporation uh, of its responsibilities to its stockholders, to its clients, to the government, and so forth. Uh, I don't have any hard and fast answers. But on balance, I think that openly identifying yourself with data that you touch is inevitably going to make the system self-policing. Okay. Now, with all the information that OSINT helps gather, who do you believe should hold the keys to it? And do you believe that those people are secure enough to hold that information? No, no, wait a minute. I think you should hold the keys to it. I think it should be public intelligence. Uh, you know, actually, OSIF should be completely public. OSINT is when you, t OSIF is broadcast. OSINT is what's created for, for a person. And obviously, if a major bank wants to, wants to put a billion dollars of investment into a specific point in Indonesia, they want to keep that secret until they've bought the land and cut the deals and all of that. And so the OSINT supporting that is unclassified in the raw form and proprietary in the finished form. And one of the things we've talked about with some Swedish companies is that it may be that you want to release that to the public domain after you've done your business so that you're adding to the pot. Um, this is not about keys. This is not about control. If anything, it's about bottom-up um, bacteria-like self-propagation and networking and on-the-fly discovery. I mean, I, I, I don't feel I'm hitting it right. Does someone want to explain to me what his question was? Do you want to add to that? With, I mean, with the information that OSINT does help gather, now there's going to be valuable information to it. Well, let me give so. you an example. Let's, let's say I have this vision. It's in my second book. of I want you to be able to sit down and type in your zip code and immediately see a list of issues that are important to you, education, water, whatever, disease. And then I want you to be able to click on, let's say, water. And boom. And so for your zip code, it shows the past water disasters and violations and the current ones and the near future and far future to the extent that that is being predicted by anyone. And then you can click and say, see a map of water in your zip code. And then all of a sudden, you'll see a citizen who is downstream from a factory who has just reported an effluent discharge. And this is like near real-time citizen intelligence. And all of this stuff, rather than being lost into the bureaucracy, is open to you for the creation of public intelligence. So it may be that based on that warning, a bunch of you get together at an OSINT meeting and say, hey, let's have someone go take a sample of the water every week or every day, or, or whatever. You see where I'm going with this? It's, it's kind of like, and I don't want to say this is original to me. I've, I'm the one that's made the transition from government to public intelligence, but uh, Pierre uh, Teilhard de Chardin had the concept of Neosphere. H.G. Wells had World Brain. Uh, Howard Bloom, who was here in New York, uh, wrote Global Brain. Um, Pierre Livy in France has written Collective Intelligence. Uh, Howard uh, Rheingold has written Smart Mobs. Um, Tom Attlee has written The Tao of Democracy. Um, the subtitle is something like How Co-Intelligence Can Make a Better World for All of Us to Live In. Uh, I don't see OSINT as a, as a restricted club. I see it as a process of sharing and, and informally acting and assigning. One of the reasons we're never going to beat the terrorism with the FBI and, and the Department of Homeland Security is because they're a command and control hierarchy. And you cannot do top-down uh, prevention. You have to do bottom-up uh, awareness and, and surge. I, I, after 9-11, I was interviewed by BBC, and I said, it ain't going to happen again. And they said, why not? I said, because the old paradigm was BCOM, see Cuba. 
okay? The new paradigm is kill the asshole or you're gonna die yourself and maybe inside of a large building. Uh, business class has figured this out, okay? I don't think we're gonna see another hijacking of the kind that we saw in 9-11. Now I'm worried about uh, the ease with which you can put suitcases loaded with explosives onto these planes and we still don't have the Kevlar carts you know, and all the planes and stuff. So we'll have more disasters. But OSINT is about a self-organizing uh, community of interest in the truest sense of the word. Next person. Are you guys okay with these questions? Would you rather have more spy stories? Spy stories? All right, you two guys, you two guys for questions and then we'll do some spy stories. Um, I'm... I really think that this is a good idea, however, I don't think that government would be willing to change over, especially with stuff like, uh, oh, what was it? I think. I don't care what government wants. No, it's no, what no. you want. Yeah, I know it's what we want, but I mean, like. Get uh, on with it. The government wants us to be, uh, you know, in prison, basically, with stuff like COINTELPRO, where, you know, they invade groups. The minute you get me 75% turnout at the polls, I get you a new government. Yeah, I understand that, and but I think that uh, most people are afraid rather than willing. I mean, obviously, Ignorance the people, the people, fear. the people here aren't afraid. We're we're trying to. Learn I think new people things, are less but. afraid than apathetic. Uh, the Supreme Court, to my enormous surprise, has concluded that enemy combatants get a right to a lawyer. Um, this is good. It took them too damn long uh, to get to that. Had I been Chief Justice or an advisor to the Chief Justice, I would have demanded that case the day it happened. I mean, Padilla should have had the Supreme Court's interest from day one, and, and it's a disgrace that they didn't. Um, look, one of the really cool things about American democracy is that you only get screwed as far as you want to be, okay? Uh, this country is apathetic, um, and I think the, the, the Democratic Party is going to rue the day that they screwed Howard Dean uh, because he was really developing momentum and he was getting people energized and he was getting new people into the process. Um, it will take another 10 or 15 years, but you know what? These guys can only steal so much before the rest of America notices. And if we have a combination of another Enron, I mean, look at the last two years. Every major institution in America has failed. Congress failed to control the purse and prevent war. Uh, the media failed to report honestly and turn down fully funded anti-war uh, infomercials. Fully funded infomercials. Academia stinks, by and large, uh, at least in my area of expertise in foreign and national security. Um, what? Yes, I agree with you. We agree on this. The media is controlled. I agree with you. But that's one of the cool things about the internet. All right, later. Okay, later, later, please. You're being disruptive. Um, <laughs> the thugs are coming. <laughs> All right, don't beat the shit out of him. Just cut his hair. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll give you five minutes of personal attention when we finish, okay? Um, every institution has failed. Our corporations are, are I mean, and you know, 95% of America is hardworking, honest, small business. Okay, it's just the big dogs that are really failing. Halliburton, uh, Citibank. In fact, there's a book I recommend to all of you, Gold Warriors by uh, Peggy and Sterling Seagraves. Gold Warriors is about MacArthur discovering all of the Japanese gold in Japan uh, that could not get through the blockade. And it became the world's largest covert slush fund for buying corruption worldwide. And presumably it's controlled out of treasury, not out of CIA. Um, bottom line for me is that, is that Jonathan Schnell has it right, Gandhi had it right, nonviolent informed resistance wins every time. You know, Jonathan Schnell has a great line in his book. He says, violence is how the few control the many. Nonviolent resistance is how the many control the few. Okay? And so I advocate nonviolent informed resistance. We can take this country back. And it starts with electoral, electoral reform. Carries a damn fool for not making it his number one issue. Thank you very much. Okay, next. Um, this is more just a, a, a comment. 
Um, several years ago, I was helping a friend write a report about um, uh, money laundering. And the topic came, how do you get communication from two unconnected parties so that you could, let's say, do a gifting network from one person to another and therefore, you know, in exchange for something like money or something. The Halawa system, yeah. yeah. And uh, got to thinking about systems like, you know, posting an eBay auction that, that theoret is theoretical and things like that. But the real big thing that really came up was what better way to communicate with, let's say, sleeper cells than with spam? I like it. A spam email message could be sent to thousands, 50 that's, of them are the, the important targets. That's very good. Everyone else is going to delete it. And it hides the ones the that to look. And most spams so are So we should look for the guys that don't delete the spam. I so like that too. What we real, yeah. And what, what we really need is anyone who replies to spam or also... Um, I like it, but frankly, they like Playboy more. Yeah. Or also, <laughs> what we thing. need is a large division of federal agents whose wonderful job it is is to read every spam they there, can there find. There isn't. There isn't. Let me tell you where the federal government is focusing. The federal government is focusing on Cuba. Uh, your boat or airplane can now be possessed without trial if you have a chart of Cuba on it and are suspected of being interested in violating the embargo. This is a major cover article in one of the yachting magazines. Okay, let's move on. I love it, both of the ideas. Last question, and then I'll try and do some spy stories. Hi. Or answer questions about spying. Hi. Um, I really like the idea of uh, a social intelligence system. Uh, do you have a particular vision for, I mean, as far as I understand, it's in a data integration system and then a system that allows... Seven tribes, analysis. seven standards, seven issues to start with. Okay. Are there any working prototypes that we could take a look Google at? Google on collective intelligence. Okay. One of the things I like about collective intelligence is, is, is some of the concepts there on... on the wisdom of the crowd, knowledge management, uh, the validation, and so on. You can also go to my website and read the OSINT story, which is inside of the OSINT portal. Um, but it hasn't happened. I think it's about to happen. Uh, OSINT.meetup, which only has 88 people signed up in 54 cities right now, but is potentially huge. Uh, OSINT.meetup.com is my best shot at trying to get people to self-organize. Imagine what would happen if here in New York City, OSINT.meetup.com created a water committee, a fire committee, uh, a uh, tunnel committee, or whatever, and then got people from police intelligence, military intelligence, uh, labor unions. I mean, these labor unions can communicate with everybody in that tunnel. You know, and, and so then self-organize. And so what kind of weekly report do you want to create for water risks in New York? What kind of distance library? What kind of uh, distance learning? What kind of virtual library? I don't have the answer. Uh, I think this is going to be self-organizing from the bottom up. And so I would say to you, whatever issue is important to you, use uh, the internet and these collective intelligence initiatives. For instance, the collective intelligence wiki was just opened. And it's already got 279 pages on it. And you can, you can Google for, uh, for Collective Intelligence Week here. You can just go to the Collective Intelligence blog. Don't look to me as a leader. Uh, I'm a provocateur, um, an agitator. Uh, you guys are going to have to lead yourselves. Okay? All right, spy stories. Well, what kind of spy stories do you want? What's that? All right, what do you suppose the most important skill in spying is? Listening. What do you suppose the second most important skill in spying is? Listening. Typing. I am not James Bond. I've carried a gun. Um, but let me tell you something. For every hour of agent meeting, you've got four hours of typing. And if you're handling a terrorist live, you have to do what's called, I said, he said, transcripts, and you're the only one that can do them, and that is a bitch. Uh, because with a terrorist, you usually end up having a four to eight hour meeting uh, because it's so hard to get in and out. And so you end up having to transcribe that four to eight hours over two to three days. It is a real pain in the ass. Uh, we didn't have IBM's voice thing uh, at the time. This was back in the mid 80s. So listening and typing are the two most important skills. Now, 
Spying consists of spotting, assessing, recruiting, handling, and terminating, which means a cash settlement, not execution. Um, although we have terminated with extreme prejudice, uh, which does stand for murder. Um, I haven't done it. But basically, spotting in theory, in any given country, you're supposed to be looking for things that are really important to national security. That's not what actually happens. Uh, across most of the world, even up to today, although today Iraq is just consuming everything, but across most of the world, we've had stations in Africa and elsewhere, primarily because that was the easiest way to get a Soviet to drink booze with us. And so, spying has been mostly about drinking with Soviets. Um, okay. I'll tell you what, you don't ever want to drink with a Soviet. Um, I mean, I never did it because it was so disgusting, but the recommended protocol is to eat a bar of butter first. Uh, it works, I'm told, but it's not something I want to do. I'd just rather get drunk and fall asleep. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, that's the main reason the clandestine service existed, to chase Soviets. We didn't give a shit about what was happening in Africa. We didn't give a shit about Hutu and, and, and these other ethnic divisions. Uh, we didn't even give a shit about internal policies that were extremely corrupt and, and uh, committing genocide. I mean, you know, how can 18 genocides go on in this world in the United States public, the United States Congress, the United States White House thinks it has other priorities? How can Lake Powell in Arizona go down by 200 meters and Las Vegas is about to lose water. They're talking about selling the Mohave Aquifer to Los Angeles, okay? Las Vegas is gonna burp in five to seven years and be out of water? This is what I would call a real estate disaster, okay? Uh, nobody's paying attention to this. Uh, actually, I love the movie, this ice movie, Climate Change. I've, I've invited them to speak at my next conference. Um, we're really not serious about not only global warming, but global freezing. We're not serious about controlling bacteria. Uh, we are going to have plagues in the United States. Uh, we are going to have a lot of these, these troubles. Um, so spying, spotting is you're supposed to kind of say, okay, let's say I want to penetrate the New York City mayor's office. Um, first thing I want to do is figure out who works there. And I want to figure out who the key people are. Who are the key communicators that handle every piece of paper that goes into the mayor? Who's his scheduler? Um, who are the people with vulnerabilities? And so you do a lot of homework on these people. Uh, and you uh, recruit what are called access agents. So let's say you want to get into the mayor's office, maybe you start with getting that really great looking blonde that's covering the mayor's office for the New York Times. Actually, they're probably too well paid uh, for some rag. You know, someone who could use an extra thousand bucks a month. And you say, look, you know, I'm, I'm False, and this is called false flagging. You say, I, I, I represent a major corporation that is trying to get a contract with the city. I'd like your help in understanding the mayor. Okay, that's how it starts. And once they get used to the thousand bucks a month and uh, you're real nice to them, and you know, they, they, they get used to committing treason. Um, and, and I think that's, that's how we do it. Uh, so spotting, assessing, recruiting. Recruiting is basically dressing it up. Uh, in a way that's acceptable to them. You understand the person well enough so you can make a pitch that they'll accept. Um, and um, most people can accept money in return for betraying an employer, uh, by and large. Especially if you make them think that it's being done in a way that doesn't actually conflict with their own ideals and, and whatnot. That's just why we like false flags so much. Um, or what are called commercial recruitments. Um, and then handling, in theory, handling includes asking them the right questions, getting to and from meetings without being seen, uh, various sources and methods for capturing their information in a way that it can be destroyed if you're arrested. Uh, one of the problems with CIA is it's, it's lazy about security. Uh, it's case officers don't live cover, they live immunity. They all carry diplomatic passports, so that the worst that will happen to them is they'll be thrown out of the country. Uh, occasionally, they'll get beat up. In Russia, they like to beat us up first. Um, 
And uh, you use these people, you use access agents to put in technical devices. Um, for example, in the overhead of, of a minister's office um, or in the uh, back seat of his car when it's at a service station. Uh, but a lot of this technical stuff doesn't work. Um, you have what's called a path loss distance, about 100 meters, 200 meters, and if you cannot get out beyond that path loss distance, you start to lose your tactical. However, because fiber and all these other things are, NSA is starting to go deaf, so close in remote is getting popular. Um, which is to say, putting stuff in to specific tactical locations uh, so that you can capture the unencrypted conversation before it goes into an encrypted system. Um, that's very labor intensive. It's a lot easier to read newspapers. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I've discovered is that pattern analysis from OSINT beats the crap out of classified intelligence. I'll tell you a real story where I took on the entire intelligence community. It's not a spy story but it has some lessons. On the 5th of August of 1995, I think it was, uh, the, the uh, Aspen Brown Commission had four witnesses on open source intelligence. One of my classmates from a Harvard intelligence policy course, Phyllis Provost McNeil, got me in, which was a surprise. Uh, Tony Lake testified, and I think he says, uh, he said something like, I call my friends at Harvard or whatever. Um, the RAND Corporation testified and they said the internet has everything you need to know in OSINT and we know how to get it. This was back in 94-95. Um, David Sarnoff Lab at Princeton, which is partially funded by the National Reconnaissance Office, came in and said, we don't know what OSINT is, but high definition TV will make it better. Uh, okay, <laughs> that was their pet rock that year. Uh, and then I came in and I said, we're missing 80% of what we need to know. And I made enough of an impression on the members of the commission so that General Allen asked me at the end of the day if I'd be willing to take on the entire U.S. intelligence community in a benchmark exercise. I said, sure, no problem. And uh, so he turned to Brit Snyder. This is 5 o'clock. I was actually on my way to DEF CON uh, to speak. Uh, and he turned to Brit Snyder, who I think will be a future leader of the intelligence community. He's the only guy, he's one of two people that served on both the Church Committee and the Aspen Brown Commission, and he was staff director. And if I were to be put into a position of power today, the first person I would call is Britt. Uh, he knows his stuff. Um, but anyway, he said, Burundi. It's uh, 5 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon by 10 o'clock on Monday, the FedEx delivery time. Let's have everything the U.S. intelligence community has, every image, every signal, every clandestine report, whatever they've got. And then he turned to me and says, do what you do. At the time, I had an assistant. I called her from the car and uh, told her where to send five faxes, and then she sent a six fax with a phone number to me. And so on Friday, the day before my speech at DEF CON, I spent the day twisting four or five, five CEOs' arms into giving me 100,000 bucks worth of free support. <clears throat> By 10 o'clock on Monday morning, LexisNexis had identified the top 10 journalists in the world reporting on Burundi and Rwanda based on their byline, all of them immediately available for debriefing. Journalists only publish 10% of what they know. And the best stuff that they know is the biographics, the corruption, all of the personality and networking and contacting details. From the Institute of Scientific Information in Philadelphia, the top 100 people in the world writing reputable academic articles and foreign affairs and other articles about Burundi and Rwanda. From Oxford Analytica in England, which is run by David Young, who worked with Kissinger on the National Security Council and attended Oxford. He's harnessed Oxford University as a little mini think tank. From them, I got 22-page uh, executive summary suitable for president or prime minister on why Burundi and Rwanda were important in terms of geopolitical references that the U.S. State Department was trying to avoid coming to grips with. Uh, from ECU publications, 100% of Burundi in 1 to 50 combat uh, charts from Russia, uh, which we don't, we don't have maps for 90% of the world, okay? We do not have maps below the 100 and 100,000 to 150,000 level for 90% of the world, and it turns out it's the 90% where all the bad stuff happens, okay? Um, and then belatedly from, uh, oh, from Jane's. One paragraph summaries of every article they'd ever written on Burundi and the military situation there. And then for me, they went out and created one page orders of battle for the tribes at a time when CIA was still counting just the, the uniform uh, army in Burundi. Uh, and then belatedly, <coughs> from Spotamaj, 100% of Burundi, cloud-free, less than three years old, already in the archives, and therefore inexpensive. CIA had one of those cute little maps, 
and a regional economic study in the chapter from the World Factbook. No shit. Okay? It was no contest. We weren't paying attention. Um, that story repeats itself every single day today. Uh, whether it's genocide or water, disease or whatever. Now, I, I don't want you to think I'm bashing CIA because the analysts, I just did a press release that was critical of Senator Roberts' recent findings. I think that he bashed the analysts too much and he didn't bash the clandestine service enough. He also completely overlooked the fact that CIA can't process everything it knows. Uh, he overlooked the fact that they're not doing open sources. Uh, he overlooked the fact that uh, DOD controls three of the national agencies, uh, which are completely disrespectful of the DCI's guidance, and, and several other things. Um, that's a real-world comparison of $50 billion versus 500 to a million uh, in gross annual operating costs. Um, I can generally beat the crap out of anybody within 48 to 72 hours for under $10,000. Um, I've perfected this as an art form. Okay, spy stories. I had to carry a gun in El Salvador. That's not very usual. I used to teach uh, rules of engagement for my battalion. It's a long, complex process of when and how you can kill people uh, with specific reference to innocent civilians. And my chief of station handed me my 9 millimeter. and he says, you use this when you don't really care about losing your job. I understood that one. That was my rules of engagement for combat in El Salvador. Um, someone asked me a question. Yes, sir. Spy story questions now. We'll move away from OSA. OK. Um, <clears throat> this might sound like an inappropriate question, but I'm, not, I'm going to frame it in Nothing's such a way. inappropriate here, as long as it's brief. It is. Um, could you talk a little bit, either whether you had direct involvement or just the history you know, of really badly botched or badly conceived CIA operations, most of which that have come from policies of politics at the very high up. I mean, oh, Central start with America, Central America. Or, yeah, Central America. Or, and then we can go on to Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you know, I, I am one of the unindicted members of the Central American Task Force. Um, I was too junior to really be engaged in drug running, money laundering, and murder. Um, but there's a wonderful book by John Perry called Lost History. And what he's talking about is, is all of the bad stuff that came out of Central America, also Vietnam. I mean, George Allen has written a book on Vietnam called um, None So Blind. And the basic thing is it's about cooking the books in Saigon and, and ignoring the truth in Washington. I don't think we needed a war in Central America. I think we have really misunderstood the power of food and water. I think we should lift the Cuban embargo and flood them with the internet. Okay, I mean, it's just flat out stupid to have an embargo on Cuba. It's the last clean beach in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, I want that beach. Uh, I, 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 yes, sir. Uh, what about incompetence? Um, it's, it's almost like there's a tenure system that people don't. Well, hang on. Have I? I haven't really answered your question. What was it? Oh. Look, after Vietnam, in fact, as a result of Vietnam, we learned how to run drugs and launder money, okay? Vietnam taught a whole bunch of case officers how to be bad boys and girls. Uh, we repeated that experience in, in, uh, in Central America, only we used Southern Air Transport and let them make the money by running drugs. Uh, we funded Contras who turned out to be really murderous, corrupt assholes. Um, and I don't think we needed that war. You know, if we would spend half the money we spend suborning people on peace ops, I think we'd get a lot further. Now, Afghanistan, nobody thought through the implications of creating a global Islamic Jihad. Uh, I will tell you, CIA did not fund bin Laden. He had his own funding from Saudi Arabia, and in fact, there were major frictions between the Arab jihadists and the legitimate Afghanistan Mujahideen. And Milt Bearden and Jack Devine are both friends of mine. Uh, and I think we really failed to think through what it would mean for Russia to lose control over the Central Asian front. Now, there are six fronts that are in play now. Um, Central Asia, where Pakistan's government is actively exporting terrorism. Saudi Arabia is actively uh, tolerating terrorism as, as a price for stability, which is false. <clears throat> but you have Central Asia, 
You have Western Africa, which is mostly Muslim. You've got the Pacific Rim running down from southern Thailand through Malaysia. Malaysia is a successful Muslim state. It's a model. We should be pouring tons of money into Malaysia and not a single American. Okay, setting up a special operations training camp in Malaysia is asking for a disaster. Uh, and then Philippines and so forth. Uh, you've got Latin America has an increasingly uh, Muslim population in the tri-border region down by Argentina and stuff. You've got increasing connections between ethnic criminal gangs and terrorists and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, and so I don't think we thought through Afghanistan. We sure as hell at the policy level did not think through Iraq because Iraq first off was an unnecessary war. Um, Saddam Hussein, what? Well, I, I kind of know how you feel about this, but I stand on my record. If you go back over my website over the last two years, you will see, if you just Google for impeach Bush Cheney, you'll see the stuff they haven't seen yet. And I deliberately decided not to delete anything now that I'm making progress uh, with certain elements of the administration. Um, intelligence failed, but policy failed too. You know, Paul O'Neill in his book, The Price of Loyalty, says that under Reagan and Bush won, um, Policy started with its ideological preferences, but at least it considered the facts. In the Bush administration, Karl Rove decides what the outcome is going to be, never mind the facts. And then Dick Cheney is the enforcer. Um, so I think we've made a lot of mistakes. And what I would like to do with CIA is clean it up to the point that every secret intelligence report has a public intelligence counterpart. And the people are treated as a constituency, as is Congress. Okay, let's go to another person. Spy stories. Uh, this is more of a methods question. Can you confirm or deny that the agency uh, used or still uses uh, shortwave numbers uh, transmissions to, to message its uh, assets? There's a wonderful directory of all U.S. Embassy radio communications um, frequencies uh, <clears throat> around the world. The last time I was involved in, in clandestine communications, it involved uh, uh, number groups, uh, and it involved uh, all radio frequencies, uh, one-time pads, uh, and usually the first digits had a, an indicator as to whether it was a real message or a filler message. 99% uh, of them were filler messages. Right. So the traffic uh, is constant, just to avoid traffic exactly. pattern analysis? Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. Anything else? All right. We'll have a question here. Please feel free to take a break. I mean, uh, I realize it's, it's hard, but enough of you seem to be interested. Yes, uh, sir. I don't know if you spoke about this. I just kind of walked in. Um, but being from the CIA and all that stuff. No, it was previously. Previously. What, what is your stand on the polygraph and using it to uh, Actively the polygraph is, is, first off, not reliable. Uh, the polygraph can be beaten. The polygraph is not a science. It is more of an art. The most effective use of the polygraph is in the pre-disclosure phase, uh, when people are inspired to reveal things and, and talk about that. Having said that, I will also say that the polygraph is a valuable tool. There's a book called Spies and Lies by one of the CIA's best polygraph examiners in Vietnam. It's a wonderful book. And if you do nothing else, read my review of that book. Um, uh, the polygraph is one of many tools. Now, the problem that we have is that Washington is dominated by a security bureaucracy that got to, it, got to its august rank after 20 years of checking safes at night. These are not rocket scientists. Uh, and they tend to, thank you, Laszlo. Uh, they tend to um, they tend to be 90% too lax and 10% too hard. Um, Ames was too lax. I mean, how much does it take to figure out that the guy paid cash for a $500,000 house and was driving a Jaguar on a GS-14's pay, which at the time was 65000 a year? Um, on the other hand, they can be like an inquisition, and they can castrate you without trial. 
Um, I just came from dinner with a case officer that was uh, basically thrown out of the agency for sleeping with an Israel, uh, Israeli and not breaking off the relationship when she was told to. Uh, she thought she was in love. I'm pretty sure he was in lust. Uh, and based on the conversation, I'm inclined to think that the Israeli may also have been saying things that were picked up by signals that she didn't realize he was saying. Sometimes Israelis will justify their expense account by claim, or others will justify their expense account by claiming that someone is a recruited agent or is providing information. It may be completely false, but he managed to screw this lady in more ways than one. Um, so the other problem with security is, and, and intelligencecareers.com really understands this problem, corporations are allowed to hire 10% of, of the people to work on a, on a contract that requires clearances without clearances but they can only do that for six months. But it takes 18 months for this incompetent government to do a security investigation, okay? And that's one of the reasons why they prefer white boys from Kansas and, and virgins from West Virginia, um, because they've never met a foreigner. Uh, and as a result, they're getting the wrong kinds of people into the system. They're also getting people that are way too young. Uh, if I were changing things today, I would take one-fifth of the people from the under-35 population. I would try not to kill them with grenade accidents uh, in training, uh, which just happened a year ago. Um, and then the rest of them are mature U.S. citizens that have spent a lifetime building cover. I can crack any cover inside of a week to 30 days. You cannot build a false legend today uh, with all the computers and everything. It's just too easy to check. So what you do is you get guys that have been 40 to 50 years old, who have been overseas, have a Rolodex, speak the language, have unwittingly built their cover, and then you bring them into the spy game. Uh, and tell them if you're caught, you're fired. So they'll take security seriously. Um, you have what are called career agents, which are very well qualified, Venezuelans, Pakistanis, whatever. You treat them just like case officers. We don't have these anymore. Treat them just like case officers in the field, but they never come back to headquarters and they never touch secrets or SIGIN or anything else. Uh, you have field stations that are multinational. This is how I would run it. You have field stations that are multinational. The DEA has figured out how to make use of honest Mexican cops. And the way you do it is you bring them out of their system and you put them into your own little uh, brotherhood group and that works. Letting Mexican headquarters tell you what they want you to know doesn't work. Okay, so we need to go after, for instance, the French are really good at penetrating the Arabs. They've managed to create a second, third generation of Arabs that are both loyal to France and able to penetrate the, the Arab communities. Uh, we should be using them. Um, and the same thing with Israelis who have some really fine Arab penetrations. Um, and then uh, last but not least, it's just business. <clears throat> we persist in treating spying as a thing that requires that you take a polygraph and that you be a recruited asset. There are some cases where I just want to be able to go up to a guy and says, look, I want you to put this technical device into this thing going to this place. I'll give you a million dollars and you'll never hear from me again. It's just business. Okay? Oh, you got to be going to exactly the right place. Um, but the point is we're being very unimaginative. And the polygraph, unfortunately, I think security has become part of the problem. Um, if I were advising a new DCI, one of my first directives would be to completely revamp security. Uh, security is now part of the problem, not part of the solution. And uh, that's true across all of the agencies. Uh, NSA polygraphs are better. This is good news for you, I'm sure. NSA polygraphs are better than CIA polygraphs. In NSA, you get a bigger, softer chair, and they're kinder and gentler in their probing. Uh, uh, so I, I encourage all of you to consider working for the U.S. intelligence community. Even if you only do it for a couple of years, it will change you forever. Um, and if you can't work for the U.S. intelligence community, then go to intelligencecareers.com and pick up a job at SAIC or any one of these uh, Beltway bandits that is making a fortune pretending to do intelligence um, and, uh, and have a little fun. Uh, just like you only get to be an infantry officer once in your life. Um, and it's something you can only do when you're young. Another question. Shall we take a break? Yes, sir. Quick question I had about these conferences. How do they handle it? It seems like they have tenure. 
We handle incompetence by ignoring it. You know, part of the problem is that in, in, the, age of, in the age of the internet, in theory, you should be able, uh, our, our approach, at least the, the CIA approach, is once you have your SITK CIA Bubba clearance, you can pretty much go anywhere and see anything. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. I mean, you should be able to only see things in your area and um, at the same time, you should not be blocked from seeing things. One of the problems we have is over compartmentation. I invented the reverse search at CIA precisely because of this. What was happening was analysts were asking questions of the system, like say, what do we know about uh, Libyan T-72 tanks doing this? And the DO was refusing to tell the analysts. Uh, and so I invented the concept of a, of a reverse search which would, which would tell the DO that this analyst had this question why they needed to know. When I was taken by my chief of station up to talk to the analyst before I went to my first field station assignment, his marching orders would mean were keep your mouth shut, don't tell him anything. Um, now we are trying, CIA has tried to merge analysts and collectors. Look, what you have is good-hearted people who are being hired by the wrong model, managed by the wrong mindset, to the wrong ends. Um, you don't create a world-class intelligence community with young kids out of Kansas and really shitty technical processing and no clandestine service and no attention to open sources of information uh, and excessive reliance on foreign liaison. So what you have is systemic incompetence rather than personal incompetence. Uh, every person there wants to do a good job. Every person there is also helpless in the face of decades of an ossified industrial era system that basically demands that you go through the motions and pretend everything's fine, uh, when in fact the system is in, is in uh, the terminal phase of its collapse. And all of us knew this in 1985. Uh, in fact, when I reviewed Janine Bruckner's book on litigating the intelligence community, what CIA liked to do to its agitators was send them to a fitness for duty physical where the emphasis was on calling them nuts and then threatening them so that they would resign in order to preserve their options for other federal employment by not being labeled nuts by CIA. Um, in fact, as I look back at the five or ten people, five to ten people that I know that had fitness for duty, physical experiences and then resigned, they weren't nuts. They were the ones that had it right. You know, John Gentry wrote, wrote a book called uh, Lost Promise, I think it is, about all that's wrong with CIA um, analysis. I've written the book on intelligence, which is all that's wrong with the entire community. Um, others have written similar books, and yet they were labeled as traitors, outcasts, uh, you know, and so forth. Had they listened to us in 1985 through 1990, I'm pretty sure 9-11 would not have happened. Okay. We brought 9-11 on our own heads. Yes, sir. Do you have any stories about inter-alliance um, action, the U.S.-U.K. agreement, or, or being stationed? Yes. Yes. The U.S. is not allowed to collect on U.S. politicians, so the British do it for us. And we collect on the Canadians, and it's like a round robin. So we break each other's laws on, our, on each other's behalf. Yes, sir. Uh, I apologize if uh, I already had, uh, this question has already been asked. No sweat. So I'm used to being ignored. <laughs> well, no, I was out. I know. 9-11. Um, um, I mean, there was in place NORAD system where basically it would intercept uh, you know, aircraft is straight out of air, uh, airspace, and system actually worked pretty good before 9-11. I mean, hundreds of air airplanes had, had gone off course, and they were able to intercept them within 10 minutes. On this day, the Air Force missed all four, I guess, or as I understand from the story. Uh, how could that happen? Well, I think the, the best account on record is Dick Clark's, although I believe the, the commission on 9-11 will, will, will come out with some other stuff. Uh, a guy named Charles Perrow, I think, wrote a book called Normal Accidents, Dealing with High-Risk Technology. He talks about how simple systems have single points of failure that fail in easy to diagnose and correct ways. Complex systems have multiple points of failure that, that interact uh, in their multiple cascade that are very hard to diagnose and fix. And the U.S. government is a constellation of complex systems that don't talk to each other very well. Uh, I'm willing to believe that 9-11 was a catalog of errors across a number of points, including Bush's not coming back to town. Um, I also 
think it's very important to emphasize that a large part of the loss of life in 9-11 occurred because our police and, and fire communications in New York suck. Uh, they're not designed to be reliable in high-rise buildings. Uh, they're not designed to be interoperable. Uh, they're not designed, in fact, this is still true overseas, as Marines are flying in to rescue an embassy, they can't talk to the embassy from the helicopter, okay? We have just basically built, I mean, you guys know the word kludge. Okay, this is kludge on steroids, okay? The U.S. government is a mess. Uh, it's got many good people. Everybody, I think, tries to do a good job, and it's just, it's, it's just a total mess. Uh, command and control, communications, computing, and intelligence is Kafkaesque. But it's been able to intercept every other airplane dead straight from airspace before that time. I don't know the I don't know the facts, but but I think here we had basically 20 to 30 minutes uh, during which half of it was wasted. Uh, there are also economies. The Pentagon has been gutted. Uh, people are no longer doing strip alerts. Um, uh, I I just I just think everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. You just refuse to believe that uh, conspiracy could have been possible. No, you show me the facts and I'll believe it. But I don't think the facts are there. Um, you know, there's this urban myth about the Israelis told every Jew in the World Trade Center not to show up for work. I don't think so. Huh? Look, let's go back to the basic fact that Al-Qaeda hit the World Trade Center with a car bomb in 1993. They have a track record of coming back to the same target. They have a, they have a fixation on cultural targets. There were, in fact, several airplanes. I, I think the grounding the airplanes immediately was one of the... Uh, in retro, I wasn't smart enough to think about this on the day of the event. I think what I would have done was sent out a broadcast message from the president to every single airline offering an immediate presidential pardon to anybody who murdered an asshole on the way to the cockpit, okay? And, and let the planes continue on their path because that cost us a lot of money to ground the aircraft. But grounding the aircraft actually prevented hits on Sears Tower uh, in Chicago and Bank of America and CNN in Atlanta, Bank of America in San Francisco and CNN in Atlanta which were also on the list. And I think there was another plane designated for the White House or the Capitol, okay? Uh, so grounding the airplanes actually prevented several other things. Um, I mean, when I look at the FBI, I know FBI special agents and they're good, dedicated, smart people who are trapped in a really rotten system. If you look at Special Agent Rowley's testimony, she's got shitty management, shitty data processing, um, shitty relations with the CIA. Uh, the whole system's broken. You know, and, and so if you want to talk about a conspiracy, I will talk about a conspiracy of inattentive publics and inattentive politicians and intelligence professionals who haven't been willing to speak up. There were 15 books by intelligence practitioner authors published in the two years prior to 9-11. That's an unheard of number of books. All of them advocating draconian intelligence reform. And nobody prior to 9-11 wanted to listen to me or anybody else. Very quickly. Uh, well. Basically, I just want to want you to either 30 confirm, seconds. confirm or deny just you don't feel comfortable uh, making an authoritative statement about the technical details involving uh, the airplanes unable to be. I would be that. willing to believe that Dick Cheney and Karl Rove understood that Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted Pearl Harbor to happen in order to be able to mobilize America. And I would be willing to, to believe that Dick Cheney and Karl Rove, if they had some inkling of 9-11, would have downplayed it in order to allow it to happen. And, and don't think this is unusual. Jim Bamford in the Puzzle Palace wrote how the JCS, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, proposed a covert operation to kill Americans on American soil uh, in order to justify an attack on Cuba. Do not underestimate the idiocy of people in power. But on balance, I think 9-11 was a catalog of errors spanning multiple years all of which can be traced back to uh, a combination of political irresponsibility and professional incompetence uh, across the board. Thank okay. You. Next. I was wondering if you t if you could tell us anything about number stations. Number stations? Yeah. Oh, we did. We did. No. I. Uh, what I can tell you is that I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just recycle. <laughs>
All right, one quick question, and then I'm going to go to the bathroom. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then I'll continue with whoever wants to survive. And if I could ask the staff to supervise the pins for 10 or 15 minutes, any of you that haven't gotten a pin, and no repeaters, I've taken your photo, every single one of you. Um, okay. Um, this might be a dangerous question. However, let's say you were a terrorist organization plotting against the United States. What would you attack, and more to the point, how would you, as the United States, defend against that sort of an attack? School kids and shopping malls across America. How do you defend it? How do you defend from it, excuse me? By scaring the crap out of every single parent. <laughs> okay, uh, Tom Ridge hasn't done it. Uh, see, we, we, we cannot do top-down protection. We have to do bottom-up protection. Um, for example, I was asked to review the Marine Corps counterintelligence, uh, counterterrorism plan uh, by a colonel that, that respected my work. And I said to him, all you've done is triple the guards and double the cement. I said, that's not how you defend an installation. What you have to do is have an 800 number or, and a website URL. And I said, you have to go out 50 kilometers around your perimeter and you have to brief every waitress and every truck driver and every rental car guy and every hotel, motel clerk, whatever, and you have to tell them what you're worried about and what you're looking for. And then when they call, you shouldn't hang up on them. Okay, so that's kind of pushing out this concept of neighborhood watch, which is a perfectly legitimate voluntary concept. It is not about total awareness and, and peeping on your ear. And by the way, in Iraq, we are jailing and killing people who are being declared as terrorists and criminals by jilted lovers and people who want to get out of debt. The same thing that happened with the Phoenix program in Vietnam. Uh, we are naive. Um, I don't believe that we are any safer from the Homeland Security expenditures on first responders. It doesn't help us do preventive counterintelligence inside America, given that I've said we've already got a thousand sleeper agents inside America. Uh, and second, everything we're doing in our foreign policy is essentially aiding and abetting bin Laden. George Bush is a bin Laden wet dream. For a short sort of follow-up. All, all right, quickly. For, for all the information that this would generate, for all the, all the calls that you're going to get and deluge of information, is the answer to sorting through this information more money, or what is the answer to sorting through? Mindset. We've got plenty of money in America. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I will be back in 10 minutes, and uh, if the staff can try and make sense of these pins, please, I ask you to be on your honor and not come up for another pin. Um, if you've already gotten one.